Hello, welcome back to our bookshop. I'm Ben Morehouse, and uh, we're talking romantic fiction today in, in today's author interview. And uh, we're talking to good friend Jules Wake. Now just bending down. Um, she's written books such as Escape to the Riviera and uh, and Talk to Me, and most recently. Uh, at the end of last year, she published uh, Notting Hill in the Snow, uh, and she actually came to our book festival to uh, to talk about that. But she also writes under the name Julie Kaplan, and she's now on her sixth book uh, as Julie. And um, this one, uh, The Little Tea Shop in Tokyo, is published today, as it happens. So, uh, And she's going to be talking to a good friend of hers and fellow romantic fiction author, Sue Moorcroft. Thank you very much, Ben. And hello, Jules. Ben's left us on our own to chat. That's dangerous. It is. How lovely to see you. How are you doing? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. And you? I'm fine. Although probably like you, I'm getting fed up with people going, oh, it must be so lovely to have all this time to write. Yeah, yeah. You, you haven't noticed having that much more then. No, in fact, I've found that, um, I'm, I mean, I'm getting lots of writing done, but normally I have the house to myself and suddenly I've got a house full of people and we're yeah. all fighting over the broadband. Yeah, yeah, same. I'm saying to my husband, can, can I turn your iPad off the Wi-Fi and turning my phone off the Wi-Fi and, and stuff? And then he's texting me partway through events to say, I'm going shopping now. <laughs> <laughs> but just thank exactly. you for going. I'm hoping I've hidden my phone somewhere and it doesn't ring. Oh, I put mine on Do Not Disturb, but I know for a fact it doesn't work because the moment I put it on Do Not Disturb, it pings. So if it pings again, I apologise in advance. Anyway, you're going to do all the talking today. Um, so do you want to just give us a quick intro? Um, in, yeah, in, in fact, I suppose I ought to have mentioned that you're Julie Kaplan and we're here today to talk about your most recent book, The Little Tea Shop tea shop in Tokyo. Um, so do you want us to just give everybody who doesn't know you a quick intro? Yes, so um, well I live locally to the bookshop which is probably a lot, not like a lot of the other authors so I'm actually train based and a big fan of the bookshop. Um, I write under two different names, Julie Kaplan and Jules Wake but Julie Kaplan um, is my next book out which comes out on June the 11th um, and it's called The Little Tokyo I can't even get it right. My own no, book, right? It's the little tea shop in Tokyo, um, which is part of um, my romantic escape series, and it's the sixth book in the series. I can't believe I've got to that many already. Um, and each one is set in a different country or a different city. Obviously, this one is Tokyo. And the idea behind it originally was that it was time to come out um, to coincide with the Olympics, which sadly haven't happened. Oh. Um, <laughs> but we just have to go ahead with, with the publishing date as is. Um, and it's set in Japan. Um, it's a story of second chance, I guess, um, about a shy young lady called Fiona who actually appeared the first time in my very first um, Julie Kaplan book, The Little Copenhagen Cafe. The Little Cafe in Copenhagen even. Gosh, can't get my teeth in today. Um, <laughs> and... The, although it's a series of books, each book is a standalone and it's a series in that some of the characters reappear from book to book. So in um, The Little Cafe in Copenhagen, there were um, a series, a set of six journalists who want, went on a press trip with the heroine. And since then, I've told the story of two more of those characters um, and Fiona is the second one. Um, although I, I must just put in a quick aside here. So in um, the little patisserie in Paris, um, I had two characters who won their names in a raffle. Um, yeah. And they're actually local to Tring, Peter and Jane Ashman. And um, I was so taken with their characters, they actually made it into a second book as well. Um, so yeah. uh, I, I, do, I, I like to revisit characters because as a reader, I do like to get a sneak preview or follow-up as to what they're doing later in life. So the Tokyo Tea Shop is the story of Fiona who appeared in Copenhagen. She's a blogger um, who's basically got arrested development. She had something bad happen to her as a teenager and she's she's dwelled on it. She's never really got over it and unfortunately her mother um, who's a widower and basically builds her whole world around Fiona has never let her daughter move on. She's not supported her and so Fiona's a little bit 
immature, still dwelling on this ancient history, which really wasn't that big a deal, but as, as a teenager it was, and she's never really got over it, and it stunted her sort of development. Um, and she goes to Japan, um, egged on by another person from the Copenhagen book, um, and the plan is that she's she's got a photography bursary, um, and she's going to Japan to take lots and lots of pictures for an exhibition that will be held at the Japan Center in London when she gets back. Um, and she's going to have a mentor who's a very famous Japanese photographer and he's renowned for his landscape photography. So she's very excited. Um, but of course, as always in our books, things never go quite to plan. And um, at the very outset in scene one in the airport where she's waiting to be met by this famous photographer, who should turn up but her nemesis from the past, the guy that caused all her problems, um, but Gabe, who's also a photographer and he's a very famous portrait photographer, but he's not who she was expecting to meet him. And the story is all about how the two of them resolve their own issues and through photography and at discovering Japan, um, find out who they really are and what they really want from life. I was really interested in Gabe actually. Um, he's a bit of a cynic. Um, I liked there being a bit of an age gap between them. Um, it's something uh, I find quite interesting is society judges us a little bit on on that kind of thing. Uh, you know, well, society judges, on, judges us on everything, let's be honest, but it seems to be one of the things. Oh, a whole, what was it, 10 years or something. But I was really interested in his backstory of he, his ex, uh, the famous model, um, whose name escapes me, but um, he almost had an obsession about her and she's still playing on that in the front story. Yes, um, very much so. And um, I think that's because he, he got so used to being with famous people that he became sort of fixated on it. And she, she was his muse in an essential. And I think part of that was that he felt a lot of his success came from photographing her. And so he was very attached to that. And there was a bit of a fear there that if he really let go of her, would, would his talent disappear as well? Was, it, was his talent basically um, rooted in, in her beauty? Yeah, and her, and her photography, her ability to be photographed. So the part of that not letting go of her and allowing her to manipulate him in the way that she does in the book um, comes from that slight fear that is he really as good as he thinks he is? Um, and the I age, wanted to shoot her. I didn't want her. That was the that was the plan. I mean, I, I did have to handle the age gap quite carefully because some people don't like it and it can be seen as coercive, um, especially as he'd known her as a student as well, which some people really didn't like. Um, so I did have to manage that quite carefully. And originally I did want them to be 15 years apart. Um, but as I wrote it, it became clear that, that that couldn't happen. People really wouldn't like it. Even though I know lots of very happily married couples who have bigger age gaps than that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yes. Um, so Japan, I went in 1986 and I felt the little tea shop in Tokyo, it was like me being able to revisit it. It updated my memories, it's that big crossing. There used to be a massive, um, it was a record shop in those days, the way in the wave building, um, just there. And so whenever we we're in the vicinity, we used to call in because you could, I was only there for three weeks. It makes it sound like I was there for years. Um, but you could get stuff that wasn't out here. And we bought a CD player and we were the only, only the second people we knew <laughs> with a CD player. And I can remember passing the CDs around it, uh, in the restroom at lunchtime because people had never seen one and it, it made me so uber cool. Um, <laughs> and my niece was four and it was terrible, you know, if you took her to the temple, one of the temples, which as tourists, we were going to the mall, you know, another day, another temple, and she would run up and try and ring the big gong thing and we'd like, be trying to stop her because it's not terribly respective, respectable, no. It doesn't respect people's prayer if you've got a, a four-year-old crashing the, uh, the, the, the thing. But um, it's obviously made a big impression on, on you, what attracts you to Japan and the landscape and the culture. I think 
think it, I was really fascinated by that, such a massive contrast. Um, I mean, we had a Swiss visitor staying in um, November last year and he'd just come back and his view of Japan the things that really excited him were completely different from mine. It was absolutely fascinating. So he went on and on about the robot restaurant and how amazing it was. And I was thinking, but what about the temples and the pagodas and the, the cherry blossom and all those beautiful things? But so his view, I mean, he's only 19, was so different from mine. So I really wanted to explore that because the contrast between the, the, the modern and that amazing tradition. I mean, for so many years, Japan was so isolated from the rest of the world. So they, mm -hmm. they managed to maintain their culture in a far better way than most other countries. And I think that's what's so fascinating. Um, and that, and the, they're, they're so respectful of their culture. And I want to get over, so with the granddaughter, I really wanted to get over that, although she was all for the robot restaurant and the modern things and, and manga and all, and dressing up and cosplay and all that sort of thing, she was still at the end of the day, um, very respectful of her mother and her grandmother's appreciation of beauty. And so I, I, yeah. I, I seen where they go um, to, to one of the parks to look at the cherry blossom and she's very grudging about it and very teenagery and she spends the whole time on her phone but actually she knows how important it is to her grandmother and that's why she always goes she never doesn't go she always goes so I, I was trying to get all of that across in the book when I was writing it and um, it was really important to have three generations of Japanese women because I wanted um, to have Haruka who's the grandmother who's very traditional and very respectful and is very immersed in the culture and talks about the things that she talks about in the book like kintsui and that sort of thing and then I wanted as a, as a, as a halfway house the mother who'd grown up in America and could see life on both sides and then the daughter who was very much for the modern and wanted fast living and didn't have much time for the traditions although deeply rooted she did and she fully expected to absorb those traditions at a later point in her life so yes I had an awful lot of fun researching the book yeah yeah I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'd love to go back um, I can remember the the cultural thing that surprised me was the men taking center stage in certain situations which in the UK I would have expected the, the young women to um, I don't know if you got to see the dancing at Amoti Standu, but on a Sunday they just close this street and everybody turns up with their, I guess it will be dock, uh, iPads and docks now, and it, it was boom boxes at the time. But it's all the guys who were dressed up in, in um, it was punk sort of stuff with huge spikes at the time, and they were dancing and the girls were all standing around and clapping in time. And, and I was bursting to get off my seat and go and join in. And my sister-in-law and brother were like holding me back and saying, no, no, it's not for you. It's really not for you. You won't be welcome. Um, but, you know, I like to dance and I wanted to be in there with all these guys. <laughs> I think a woman's place has changed a little bit in the last 20 years. I, th I think they are allowed to be a little bit more out there, especially, I mean, the girls in their cosplay and their costumes yes. are really, really out there. I mean, that, that, that whole thing is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, so yeah. I, was, I was just going to grab a book from my bookshelf, actually. Okay, I'll, I'll talk among myself while you're doing that. I was just, what, so obviously you go to the country and you absorb a lot of things while you're there, but you have to do your desk research. And I was lucky enough yeah. to find this beautiful, beautiful book. And I really recommend it because it's all about the culture and the ceramics and design. And it covers so much. It was, you can see yeah. from all the tabs. It was absolutely yeah, invaluable yeah, yeah. Um, because although you, you can you can visit a country and you can pick up a certain amount, but you still have to do your desk research and, and to dig a little deeper. And there were a couple of themes that I picked up from the research that I wanted to explore within the book. So like this concept of Kintsui, um, which is, I don't, I don't know if you knew about it, but it's where it's they- It's in my new book. Sorry? It's in my new book. Oh, marvellous! Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the Japanese um, have great um, uh, appreciation of aesthetic beauty um, and beauty in, in something 
of its own. And so if something is broken, like a vase, they will mend it with golden glue to retain the original integrity, but to make it still beautiful, even though it has been broken. But there's beauty in that break and the fact that they've cared for it. And it was a concept I'd never heard of, and I thought it was absolutely fascinating, especially as my character, Fiona, has got that break in her. She's mm. been broken at quite a young age and she needs to be fixed. And her trip to Japan is about being fixed. And um, the whole concept of Kitsui just it fitted perfectly. Yeah, yeah, it really did. Uh, I can <laughs> get it into a book about Malta, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> I'm fascinated to read that one now. <laughs> it's, it's kind of in passing, but you know, it's somebody's got. Um, a craft business and that's their their contribution to it right. um, so um i like also fiona and gabe having a past um i love reunion books anyway to read you know i love all your books that i haven't met a book of yours that i didn't love whether you're being julie kaplan or jules wake on that day um and this book was really up there with with the best in my view and i think part of that is it's a reunion book they, they had a thing, it wasn't a big thing. Um, well, it depends how you look at it, whether it was a big thing, but it wasn't like they were married or anything. No. Um, and I love this bringing back together. But you have to do this, you have to walk this tightrope of there was an attraction and then there wasn't and now there is again. So how did you handle that? Um, I, I, that's really interesting because my favourite book of yours is, 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 is The Reunion, A Summer to Remember from last year. Um, when they have met, they've had a tiny bit of a thing, not a big thing, but that flare of attraction and then for whatever reason they, they separate. And that's one of my favourite books of yours. So maybe we have that sort of common theme that we, we like that idea yeah. of a second chance and second time around. Um, I, I just, I really like the idea that it's the idea that they were meant to be together and then it didn't happen. And now it might happen again. And that meant to be together. It's just that flare of passion, of love, of lust that never gets to be explored. But it was there. And it's like, was it there? Wasn't it? And so you can explore that. So, I mean, Fiona thinks she's made a terrible fool of herself because basically the story is about when she kissed the teacher, um, which she shouldn't have done. But in an adolescent fit of thinking, oh, he really likes me. I'm going to kiss him. Um, and then she gets caught and everybody talks about it and she gets bullied at school for, for letting it happen. Um, and what I really liked is the idea that she wasn't imagining it at all. And that's the big payback that actually he did really like her, but he couldn't kiss her back because he was her teacher and it was wrong and um, it was inappropriate behavior. And that's why he pushed her away, not because he didn't actually like her. Um, and I read, and, Fiona's confidence it all comes back when she realizes that actually she hadn't imagined it at all but how old was she when she kissed him she wasn't like 12 or something it's not anything weird. Yeah. yeah so it wasn't like against the law no no but you, as some people have still complained about that yeah you said I'm a teacher it's inappropriate and I was very careful because I've worked in a school and um and my daughter went to a school where um, people were very conscious that that didn't happen, an all-girls school. Um, so I was really careful about, he wasn't, he, he was a teacher, um, but they weren't at school, they were a summer camp, it was a summer photography camp. So he was a visiting lecturer, he wasn't a proper teacher, um, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. Um, no. But I think at 17, your hormones are going, you imagine things, you have crushes on people. Um, and when you look back on them, you think, oh, my God, I was such an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so did that come from your past then? Were you an idiot at 17 with someone? I do remember having the most ridiculous crush on a boy. I was probably about 15. I'd never even spoken to him didn't know what it was like or anything but I had this stupid crush on him um which luckily wore off but I, to this day I have absolutely no idea where I suddenly decided he was wonderful it's it's hard isn't it I I uh, I fell in love for the first time when I was 17 um and he ended things in a not particularly 
nice way although in later years he did redeem himself in my eyes by doing a whole load of work for me free but in the intervening <laughs> years in the intervening years if i had a character with bo and halitosis i called him phil <laughs> which is so pathetic <laughs> Oh, I like that idea. Do you know, I, I talk about doing that, but I've not actually done it yet. I think if I ever wrote a thriller, um, I would definitely kill a few people off. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope none of them are called Sue. That's all I can say, because I should be watching. <laughs> <laughs> so both Fiona and Gabe are photographers. Um, so I love the pun. How, why did you focus on that? Because um, I wanted them to visit lots of different places um, and I also wanted to, to see things from very different viewpoints because Gabe's very jaded and cynical he's been there done that whereas Fiona's bright eyed this is the first time she's been to Japan and I just really, I wanted to contrast the two viewpoints which I could do quite neatly through their camera lenses so he was oh that's very hackneyed it's all been done before but she still managed to bring a new spin on things and, and one of the the things in the book is that she she's got to put together this exhibition um, and of course everybody's got lots and lots and lots of pictures of, of Japan you can look them up on the computer there's, there's nothing new and of course she's got to put an exhibition together and she's really keen for it to be new and different so she's looking for a different angle and one of what she comes up with is the way that other people see those tourist sites for the first time that wonderment and and oh my gosh isn't that amazing so so she comes up with the idea that she's going to capture that and of course Gabe watching her thinks I've lost all that I've lost that wonder and he starts seeing through her eyes that actually there's still a lot, there's still different angles to take. There's always a different view. Okay. Um, I, was, I was quite pleased we've with got more puns about photography than, <laughs> than we need there. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. So I was quite pleased with how that came out. And in, in yeah. fact, I um, spoke to a, 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 an, old, uh, an old work colleague who's very good at amateur photography um, down in Brighton. And um, I actually asked her for lots of information and tips and things. And I waved it all into the book. And then my editor said, too much technical detail. The readers won't be interested. So I had yeah. to take it all out again. Yeah, yeah. Been there, done that with, with yeah. various, various things. Um, I thought that actually, uh, as a reader, and you can't really stop completely being an author. I love, I love other authors who carry me away and do stop me being an author, but then there's just the odd thing that, that I, my, my editing hat descends when I'm reading other people's stuff. And that moment when he'd been not dismissive of her work, but maybe slightly patronizing very much this, I'm the mentor and, and you're yeah. the mentee. And um, I, I, I took this job on as a favor for somebody. Um, and that kind of was coming across to her and making her less and less willing to forgive him for for not loving her enough in the past. Um, but I felt that was pivotal when he began to see her as having her own ideas and that she would throw herself full length to get on the grass to get the right photo and things like that, you know, even though the, the ground was wet. Um, I thought that he was beginning to that that was his the beginning of his journey out of this obsession he'd had with his his ex and muse um and you didn't jump in before and remind me of her name so what is it miko miko right um and i felt that was the beginning of his journey was when he 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 got his head out of his own problems shall we say for a minute um and i thought that that was really a pivotal moment in the plot i'm really pleased you picked up on that because um that, that scene where she throws herself on the grass to take that picture, that was exactly what it was supposed to do. And oh, I, I always write a really dirty draft um, and get it all down. Um, and then the themes and things start to, to, to appear. I, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a planner. Um, I'll do a rough plan and I know where I want to end up. But things just evolve. It's a very organic process, which is quite frustrating because I end up shopping a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but it's only when I get to the end, the things like the kintsui and that sort of thing, and the bit about 
him starting to see the world afresh through her eyes really came to the fore after I'd written the first draft. So I then went back and I did do quite a lot of work on that scene to make sure that that, well, it obviously did, it worked, um, to bring that forward because I, re I really wanted him to see her pure joy in that moment of capturing the in the exact shot you want to or the the miracle of it it's just appeared in front of your eyes and he'd lost that and yeah. he, but he got it back and I hopefully I, I showed that in the celebrity shot where he's shooting the the, the actor um that he, he 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 was looking for that shot and it just appeared and he kind of learned that from her although he was the mentor um I think um I used to find as a tutor I don't really teach now but um I used to find that you learn from your students as well because you've got to pick out what worked and what doesn't work and say so that he actually learned that from her so he got something out of the process it wasn't a one-way street at all yes I, li I like the idea of the the the, the, the mentor teaching them the mentor the mentor teaching the mentor and um, I mean mm. what you say about when you were teaching I, I appraise manuscripts for the Romantic Novelist Association and its new writers scheme and I always get something out of every single one I read um, and it makes me think about my own work and am I doing this and am I remembering to do that and could I go further and could I, I dig a bit deeper sometimes yeah so I don't think you're ever too old to learn you no. can always learn something what I learned from your books is the, the, um, the deft touch you've got with description. Um, it's often, it's a metaphor or a simile you use that wouldn't have occurred to me. It's only half a sentence or a sentence or two. It's not like you spend half a page describing the quivering of a nostril or anything, but um, you know, I really, I, 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 uh, I always thought the same about Jilly Cooper as well. It's a real gift, I think, just to, Put an image in people's minds with a simile or a metaphor well that's very kind of you to say sue because i i've been a huge fan of yours for a long time even before i started writing so that's very high praise um i think it may be because i write as if i'm watching a film so I, i'll i'll sit there and i'll imagine the scene and i put myself in it yeah um i i, I do make myself cry sometimes yeah um when I wrote the final scene, I'm, I did make myself cry and I've just written another book and I, I made myself cry in, in a couple of scenes because I, I suppose it's a bit like method acting. My yeah. son's training to be an actor, so we spend a lot of time talking about character and how you develop things. And I do really get into the heads of my characters and I, I, I do sit there and I am imagining that I am them. Mm. And I don't want things to be cliched, so I work quite hard at trying to imagine what it feels like from that character's point of view. So I'm writing quite a tricky scene at the moment for my next next but one book, and um, I've, I've, I've sat there and thought, right, how would he feel in that situation? Um, and tried to, right, tried to put myself mm. in his shoes. I, I used to, um, particularly for short stories, write down the first 10 words or phrases that came to mind in that situation. Um, because I, I think that kind of snap reaction helped me. And sometimes it would make me see I was taking the character in the wrong direction for that publication. Um, because if I thought it was coming, it, you know, if I was looking at motive and I thought it was coming from too dark a place, I think, well, that's not the people's friend then, is it? You know. <laughs> So I think things like that, everybody has their their trigger or their their way in. And I, I definitely see method acting and characterization for writing as, you know, quite close together. Um, and there are some great people, great writers who have been actors. That That's very true. I was just about to ask, because I mean, your characters are very strong and, and that's what I particularly like about your books. Um, I mean, there are lots of exercises where you are, you know, what you write down all these details about your character, what paper they read and all their backstory. Do you spend a lot of time doing that? I mean, I don't. My characters seem to pop into yeah. my head formed. But do you do that sort of thing? Yeah, I do. And I like to do it by longhand. There's something about getting it out of my head and down my arm. Um, and I look at 
uh, no character for me was ever born on page one. I don't seem to have that capacity that you've just described. I um, like to look at them from other characters' points of view. Um, if, we, if we think of ourselves, we're, we act differently with our romantic partner, with our children, with, if we have a boss, um, you know, with, with, with our parents, if they're still around. Um, you know, I never, till the end of my mum's life, ever said the F word in front of her. Um, whereas I would liberally sprinkle it with my friends, you know, and it's, you are different people. And so I look at a character from a lot of different people who are in the book because I find that makes them multifaceted and I learn about their backstory and I find backstory just so important. Um, but I wish I, I'm sure it would be a big time saver for them to just ping into my head fully formed. It doesn't happen. Well, I, I say that they, they start that way, um, but I do have to do a lot of work developing them. But it's really interesting what you said about writing longhand, because when I'm planning, as much as I plan, I do make lots and lots of notes in notebooks and it's always longhand. I can't do it in, an, on, on, I mean, when I'm typing and writing the book, it flows straight from my head to my fingers, no problem. But planning and thinking about the book in advance, I always have to do it longhand, always in notebooks. I've got lots of different notebooks. Mm. Um, but but that, that seems to be an essential part of the process. I think it's the same if if somebody like my husband if he does the crossword if he can't get the last couple of clues will sometimes pass it over and say see if you can get them and I've got to hold the pen I can't yeah. think if I haven't got the pen in my hand there's something from when you're taught at five or whatever to write your name and to and to create at all it's with a pen or pencil in your hand and and so you know that's I guess I never quite, although I learned to type at, at 15, 16, and I, I'm a fast touch typist, and like you, I type the entire manuscript straight onto the machine. There is something about that giving birth process and, and anything tricky. Yeah. If, a, if a scene's not working, then out comes the spider and balloon plan, the mind map, whatever you want to call it, uh, right all over the page and try and work out what it is I'm trying to say, what the message is. Yeah. I am um, I definitely great believer in pen and paper. I mean, quite often if I, I if I suddenly think of a scene, I'll, I'll some, or, or when I'm rewriting, maybe I've got a big editing job from the structural edits. I might actually rewrite a scene longhand just because. Oh, really? Yeah, just because it's only one scene and it's it needs to be separate from the manuscript to get it right. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I might I quite often do that longhand or make, I'll make notes all over the manuscript. I have to print it out you to do my do. structural edit. I can't, yeah. I can't do it on the machine. Well, I don't do that, but I print out the edit notes and write on those. Sometimes, you know, like an unsmiley face. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that between the tear stains? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, editing, we could do a whole hour just on that, really, couldn't oh. we? Maybe we ought to. Maybe we ought to do yeah. a how we edit kind of uh, thing for YouTube. I think it would be yeah, interesting. How to write masterclass or how not to write. Yeah, how to unwrite. Yeah. yeah. How not, how, how to still love your editor at the end of it. Um, oh, God. <laughs> so, so tell us, um, we're, we're sort of coming towards the end of time and there's a couple of, um, well, not the end of all time, you know, the world isn't going to explode. I mean, the end of this video. Yeah. So um, I, there's a couple of questions I want to get out. And one is about your next, what's next in the pipeline for readers and what you're actually working on now, because I know like me, you write two, you know, you write more than one book a year. And so you're always working on more than one thing. So what's, what's, what's up, Jules? So uh, it's very exciting. I've got um, another three Julie Kaplan books, a contract for another three, um, which at the moment, are, the next one will be set in Switzerland, ironically, which is where your last oh. one was set. Um, so yeah, it was I, indeed. I need to make sure I don't pinch any scenes from there. <laughs> um, but, uh, and unfortunately, I do like to get try and go to a country to get a real flavour, but um, I'm not sure... Tricky. I'll be able to get to Switzerland. So I might have to call you and pick your brains a bit. Um, I can share photos with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I have a Jules Wake book out in the summer, which I'm very excited about. It's coming out in August. And it's all about the park run. 
it's called the Saturday Morning Park Run and it's about a group of people who are all a little bit um, uh, anxious, stressed, lonely, um, who come together and set up their own park run and through running um, discover um, a better way of life. It sounds a bit um, evangelical, I don't mean it to be, but I'm a reluctant runner um, but I've discovered an awful lot of pleasure from doing my local park run on a Saturday morning. So um, I, it, it just came about and I, I've, I've written a book all about people who set up a park run. So I'm, I'm very excited about that one. It will and then there will, be a, there will be a complete diversion. The next Jules Wake book after that will be a historical novel. Wow. Set when? Uh, World War II. Wow. Um, I just discovered a very interesting story which is quite local to here um, and it fascinated me and so I've, I'm looking at, at well, I mean I've got the plan um, of writing the, the story set against a realistic background of what really happened but will be with three fictional characters but it's quite interesting because in that world um, women were given an awful lot more responsibility um, yes. than the time would normally suggested um, and I really wanted to explore what women can do when they're given the chance. And then in the 50s all the women's magazines tried to put us back in our place all the advice was to have your you know put your lipstick on ready for when your husband comes home and pipe and slippers by the hearth and all that because they were trying to stop women taking the jobs off the men weren't they? Yeah I mean it's quite interesting that women had extremely senior jobs with just because they could do them so well and were promoted incredibly quickly um, during the war. Um, but as soon as it was over, that all disappeared yeah. again and they weren't allowed to work if they were married, no. which I find completely bizarre. Yeah. Well, my mum was in the army in the 50s, so I could tell you about it. Uh, well, so was my dad for that, for that matter. Yeah. So my last question is um, about park runs or, or about running anyway. Tell the, tell the listeners and viewers the story of you and the cow pat. <laughs> that's mean <laughs> I know <laughs> so I do quite a long run a couple of times a week it's about eight kilometers um where we live in Tring we have the most amazing park and it is absolutely beautiful it's also very high up it's about a hundred meter climb um so it's quite a tough run but I was on the home leg coming down the hill and we get to a bit called Cowpat Alley <laughs> in the winter it's horrendous it's at your ankle deep in mud and cow pats and at the moment it's very dry so in the past they've they've cut, tried to soak up the mud with bricks and things Ooh. and unfortunately as I came out there was a cow right in the way and the rest of the herd was over to the left so I could either go between this cow and the herd which I wasn't too happy about doing or I could dive it right and round it between him and the fence and um, I was so busy looking at the cow, I didn't look down and there were these bricks just poking oh. up and I just ripped over one and I went straight down on full face plant, but right in a couple of fresh cow pats. So <laughs> to add indignity to everything, I came home dripping with blood and unmentionables and <laughs> even thin men on my way home gave me a wide berth. <laughs> Not my finest hour, but oh, um, I'm back running again. Right in a book. <laughs> I will definitely put it in a book one day, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, um, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, this chat, Jules. Just remind everybody before you say goodbye, um, the title of the new book and when it comes out. So it's The Little Tokyo Tea Shop. comes Not out on June the 11th in paperback and on kindle i'm hoping it's in paperback there are problems with printing at the moment because of the yeah yeah the, the lockdown so but I've, I've been told it should be all right um yes out on june the 11th and uh, i hope everyone will take a peek at uh, the wonders of japan and um, it's been absolutely lovely to see you sue and i hope that we'll get to do it you. Life very soon yeah yeah like with wine or something definitely <laughs> Thanks a lot for chatting. Cheerio. Nice to see you. Bye. Massive thanks to Sue and to Jules for that wonderful interview. Uh, so A Little Tea Shop in Tokyo is available in our bookshop, uh, 01442 827 653. 
Follow the blurb underneath. I'll also list um, Jules, Jules Wake and Julie Kaplan, as well as Sue Moorcroft's uh, most recent books as well. So uh, if you fancy ordering any of those, do give us a shout. Um, author interviews are carrying on. I've got about six already pre-recorded, uh, which we'll be posting out in the next few days. So uh, do, do subscribe to our YouTube channel, and uh, we'll hopefully see you very soon for the next one.